One of the great books in the Bible is the book of Job, which addresses the great problem of human suffering, how to cope with human suffering. On our program today, we're going to discuss this book in detail. I hope that you'll stay tuned. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed, that the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real. Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above, the Spirit then taught them the truth in love. And now your host for The Truth in Love, Dave Miller. Good morning and welcome to our television program, The Truth in Love. We have a great study for you today and hope that you will plan on sitting and perhaps taking notes and get, be sure and get your Bible and open it to the book of Job. Together, Johnny Ramsey and I will discuss uh, great lessons from the book of Job. Johnny, why don't we start by kind of setting the uh, stage, the setting of the book. Uh, Job chapters 1 and 2 does that for us. And uh, what we find is a man by the name of Job who is uh, an extremely wealthy man. He is um, a righteous man. In fact, he's described uh, in the first verse as, as fearing God and, and being upright and perfect and departing from evil. He's really a good spiritual man. But he's also described in the first chapter as being an extremely wealthy man. In fact, the text says he is the greatest of all the men of the East. So he must have been uh, famous, well-known, highly advanced in his uh, material possessions, had uh, seven sons and three daughters, so he has a very large family. And yet then we are introduced uh, to Satan and God having a conversation. And God says, have you noticed Job and how good he is? And Satan's comeback is, well, what do you expect? Look what you've done for him. You've hedged him in. You've protected, given him everything he could possibly want in life, and plus protected him from any of that being challenged. And so uh, Satan's point was that, God, if you'll take some of that away from Job, he won't be nearly as religious as you think he is. And so God enables Satan to do that. Notice that he does that through non-miraculous means. There are invading marauders that come up and carry off his flocks and kill his servants and hired hands. And that culminates in the death of his ten children, all ten of them, in a house together and a big tornado comes up and collapses the house, kills every one of them. And yet, uh, despite that, Job hangs on to his religious convictions before God. And so once again, Satan says, well, the, the reason is, is because a man will give everything to save his own neck. But you, take, you start affecting his own body, and that's when he will lose his religious conviction. So God said, all right, I'll let you do that, but you can't kill him. It's interesting, we learn also there that uh, God has power over Satan, not vice versa. A lot of people think that the forces of darkness and black magic and Satanism and all that shows Satan to be some sort of a challenge to God, but he's not. God has total control over all beings in the universe. 1 John 4, 4 says, He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. In Romans 16, 20, God shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. So biblically, God is superior to Satan. Uh, he's, God is simply allowing Satan to operate because the nature of the universe is such that there must be choices for people to make both good and evil. I think it's interesting in Ezekiel 14, 14, Job and Noah and Daniel are mentioned as three of the greatest who ever lived. Mm -hmm. So Job's in high company. Right. Well, the way uh, one, chapter 1 and 2 concludes then is that Satan is permitted to inflict Job with a serious physical illness. It was apparently life-threatening and uh, <clears throat> terminal, a terminal disease, skin disease. Paul called his thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan From to Satan. buffet me, 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians 12. That is true. Well, that's what, that's what Job had. He had the messenger of Satan which came to him in the form of a disease and it caused him such torment and affliction. And yet again, uh, both chapter 1 verse 22 as well as uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 10, we're told right up front, Job did not sin with his lips. He did not renounce God or curse God or blame God. In fact, he made that famous statement, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If, if I came into this world with nothing, everything I've accumulated since then is at the hand of God. And therefore, if I lose it all, I, I have no reason to complain because it wasn't mine to begin with. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 7, Put the brethren in mind not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. All right, so to set us up for these great uh, lessons that we learn from this book, let me just say that the first two chapters show the great suffering and tragedy that came upon Job. 
because he was a faithful man, and this was all spawned by Satan. And then his three friends show up, and um, they sit with him. The reason why they came was to mourn and sympathize with him, and they sit with him for about seven days, and then they unload on him. And they basically argue up through chapter 31 that uh, the reason why Job is experiencing all of this terrible pain and suffering is because he has sinned against God, he has committed some grievous error. Some have said of his friends that at least they came and they were quiet for a long time, but it was a shame they ever opened their mouth. Right. That is so true. And his wife said, curse God and die. Right. But he said, there's a place where the wicked cease from troubling and where the weary be at rest. Mm -hmm. Had he put too much trust in human comradeship, he would have been a loser. He trusted and cared, but he didn't put ultimate trust in anyone but God. Otherwise, he'd never made it through this serious problem. So that's one of the good lessons then that we need to zero in on. If Job's three friends had been so much a part of his life that their attitude and their view of things would affect how he stood in life, then he'd have been a goner because they just came down on him hard and, and criticized him and, and accused him and mistreated him verbally. One of the saddest things is they concluded you're suffering much because you are a sinner. You have sinned much, so you suffer much. They mm -hmm. equated his suffering with sin, but James 5 says, if he have committed sins, mm -hmm. talking about someone who is ill. So sin and suffering, though sometimes go together because of the nature of the sin, uh, it's not always parallel. Not necessarily, right. That's right. And they drew and the conclusion it's always that case. And that's, that's not much... Uh, friendship when you're in agony and someone says, well, you're in agony because you deserve to be. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be much comfort, would it? You know, Johnny, I run into people even today that some misfortune will befall them or someone else, and they immediately draw the conclusion, oh, what have I done to deserve this, as if there's a direct link. But as you say, biblically, not necessarily. In Job's case, it was not God doing it at all, even though the friend said, God's punishing you because you've sinned. And Job said, well, God's punishing me. He's doing this, but I haven't done anything to, to merit this, so I don't understand why I'm suffering. Right. But as a matter of fact, they were both wrong. Satan was the author of this, and he was after Job because Job was righteous. And Job almost became self-righteous to the extent of saying he hadn't sinned at all. And that's another mistake. 1 John 1, 7 through 10, if we say we have not sinned, or if we say we have no sin, uh, we lie and do not tell the truth. Right. So there's a balance here, and it also shows just as the people caused Moses, the meekest of all the men of the earth, to sin, we can allow others' weaknesses and poor analysis to cause us to go to an extreme to find an extreme. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be very reliant upon God in prayer and humility, or we may allow what others say and do and think to affect us in a negative way spiritually. Keep our balance then and our stability based upon God's Word, not what <clears throat> men say or men do to us. One of the things that I've read over and over in Job that is of monumental value, no one could see the brevity and uncertainty of life any more than he, from a very wealthy man with a wonderful family, crops and cattle, to zero. Mm -hmm. And yet he could see the vanity of earthly things. He said, my life is swifter than a weaver's shuttle and is spent without hope. Job 7, 6. My days flee away, Job 9, 25. Man that is born of woman is a few days in much trouble, Job 14, 1. No man is sure of life, Job 24, 22. So the brevity and uncertainty of life means we ought to apply ourselves to wisdom and number our days, as Psalm 90, verse 12 says, and not live in vain or hopelessly, but live for God so that whenever our end comes, whether soon or late, we're ready to meet Him. James chapter 4 certainly describes that in great detail for the Christian and compares the human lifespan to nothing but a little wisp of a little mist in the air that appears for a little while and is gone. And so and then in 1 Peter 1 he said it's like the grass of the field and the flower of the grass and the grass withereth and the flower dies. Mm -hmm. But the word of the Lord abideth forever. We've got to tie on to the eternal things and that's not physical life. So uh, another then uh, teaching that we get from the book of Job is that, number one, Job was not tied to this life and he was conscious then of the brevity of life. Notice also then that where he did have his ties was in God. He trusted in God. In Job 9.33, we have what is one of the most bittersweet verses in the Bible. Job said, Oh, that there were a daysman between thee and me, O God. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the King James Daysman is archaic now and mediator or umpire or go-between, mm -hmm. intercessor. Mm -hmm. But here's Job bereft of friends that can help him, a wife who has turned away from him, all alone on an ash heap, and it's just between him and Jehovah in heaven, and he said, I really wish I had a mediator. What Job longed for, we have as Christians. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews 7, 25, Romans 8, 34. Mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy 2. That's right. And so we have what Job longed for, and yet sometimes we don't use the mediator he wished he had had. Mm -hmm. We're to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need, mm -hmm. Hebrews 4, 16. And the prayers of the saints come up as sweet-smelling incense in heaven before God's throne, Revelation chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. But here's Job all alone and really all alone except with his verbal communication with the Father, and he doesn't have that mediator who comes to our aid and our assistance as Christians. We're really blessed, Dave, in times of sorrow and trouble, and we ought to use that avenue other times than when we're afraid or scared mm -hmm. or want something. Chapter uh, 13, verse 15 of the book is where he gives that great expression of um, confidence that uh, mm. somehow, some way, this is going to be worked out when he says, though he slay me, yet will I hope or trust in him. So he's anticipating some sort of intervention that will settle this thing and set the record straight. I believe that Job 13, 15 is the greatest single expression of human faith in the Bible. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It's like Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 and Habakkuk 3, 18. The just shall live by faith. Mm. That's not a deep doctrinal treatise, as Calvin and Luther said it mm -hmm. was. It's a simple statement of fact. Mm -hmm. Who will still be standing when all the smoke is cleared and the debris is gone? Only the faithful, loyal child of God. Mm -hmm. So in Habakkuk 3, if we were to use the vocabulary for our day and time, our vernacular, Habakkuk 3 said, though there's no cattle in the field, no crop in the barn, no clothes on my back, no food on the table, no money in the bank, still I will trust in God. Well, that literally all happened to Job, mm -hmm. just what literally. Habakkuk 3 mm -hmm. says. And he said, I'll still trust in him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust mm -hmm. him. That doesn't mean, though, as we both know, that he never wavered. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Job 30, verse 20, very humanly he said, I cried unto God and he didn't hear me. Mm -hmm. And everybody of any age will have to admit they didn't think God was listening to them somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. But the last chapter gives the end of the book. We stop short of the last chapter a lot of times. Mm -hmm. God blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Mm -hmm. So God was listening. God did hear him. God did bless him. But we've got to, well, we sing a song, hold to God's unchanging hand. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep on keeping on. Right. He really went through an awful lot. And uh, there's even an indication that this could have lasted months because he said, months of vanity are pointed for me. Uh, may well have gone into to years. Uh, we don't know how long this disease ravaged his body and yeah. how long it could before Dave, it killed him. Dave, I know that you teach the book of Job in our school of preaching, and the boys appreciate it so much they tell me real often. I wish you'd discuss with me and with all of us chapter 38 and that section where God appears to Job and takes him down a notch and humbles him and tells about him being the creator and that he can handle Job's life. I think that's one of the most interesting discussions well, you know, in the Bible. Well, it's clear that Job never sinned uh, in, uh, the Bible affirms that he was a righteous man, that he, that he held fast to his integrity, that he didn't give it up. He never did what his wife urged him to do, and he didn't do what uh, Satan said he would do, turn on God and curse him. But what he did do in those chapters is to become a little bit uh, overboard on demanding that God give him answers because he said, look, I haven't done anything that I'm aware of and therefore I deserve to have somebody come to me, this, this redeemer or umpire, somebody to step in here and arbitrate and set the record straight and show that I haven't done anything. So his desire to affirm his innocence went a little bit overboard to the point of questioning God. And so in chapter 38, when God breaks his silence and speaks, and really that's what Job's been begging for over and over, for God to say something, come and give me some answers here. God finally breaks in and basically has the attitude of, who do you think you are? That I've got to come and stand before you and give an account of my behavior or, or how the universe is to operate. And so he literally gives a series of statements to Job to, to show Job how little he knows and how little he would understand even if God did try to explain it to him. Like, where were you when, when I laid the foundations of the earth? And where were you? And how did you explain to me how all this operates that I've created? He talks about the huge animals that he made that 
Job can't even withstand, but God created. Yeah, and controls with no trouble. Yeah. I, I get the impression that this is the punchline. If I could make the world and all things in it and make the world out of chaos into something of unity and design, I could probably take your own little personal life, Job, and make it worthwhile if you'd mm -hmm. let me. Right. There's That's really a, tinge of a tinge of humor mm -hmm. there. But he just literally, in chapters 38 through 41, God just literally overwhelms Job with the marvels of, of the created order. I even think, Johnny, in chapters 40 and 41, that we have a description of what we would call dinosaur-type creatures. Chapter, um, let's see, chapter 41 speaks of Leviathan. Chapter 40 speaks of behemoth, which is, I mean, it's described as a massive creature that has a tail like a cedar, like a tree. And uh, the creature in chapter 41 is a sea creature of some sort that has such uh, strong um, skin that uh, that human spears and so forth uh, can't, can't penetrate, can't penetrate it. Mm -hmm. So these are incredible creatures that God sets forward as proof that we human beings can't even begin to tackle human nature and the mm -hmm. creation. Well, so why would we think that we could second guess God or understand or deal with all of the things that He is about? Writers in days past thought those two represent the hippopotamus and the mm -hmm. crocodile, but really there are some descriptive phrases there that fit doesn't the fit those dinosaurs, doesn't. Yeah. and uh, yeah. so that is probably it. I think one of the outstanding things in Job, though, is how Jesus answers some of the questions of Job in the first century. Mm -hmm. I suppose the most haunting question is Job fourteen fourteen. Job said, "If a man die, shall he live again?" Mm -hmm. And in John 11, verses 24 to 26, at the graveside of Lazarus near Bethany, Jesus finally answers Job's question. Centuries went by and no one answered Job's question. Because mm -hmm. Job doesn't deal with uh, giving answers to what and why, but who. Mm -hmm. God is the whom that right. he should be concerned with. But Jesus said, in essence, Job, I'll answer your question now. Yes, if a man die, he'll live again. For he said, if a man really believes in me, he'll never die. For I am the resurrection and the life. John 11, 24, 26. So Jesus Christ answers Job's longing and the longing of all human beings mm -hmm. as death comes near or seems to be near. We think of another life, another world. So Jesus answers Job's question. Jesus is the daysman for Christians that Job longed for. Mm -hmm. Some really brilliant analogies. There between are a lot of connections. You know, the suffering that Job went through is surely parallel to the suffering that Jesus went through. And, uh, and even the Paul, fact that he was and, innocent. In 2 Corinthians 12, he had a thorn in the flesh. He besought the Lord again and again to remove it. It was a, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. But the Lord said, no, but my grace is sufficient for, the, mm -hmm. for you. Job, I won't remove all your suffering or I won't answer all your questions. Won't even explain it. Yeah. I'll show you my power and that's enough to rely on. And in chat, you, uh, talking about chapters 38 through 41, that's clearly what Job gets out of that. He, know, he never does get the answer that he wanted. He, God never says, now, as a matter of fact, what's happened here is Satan came to me mm -hmm. and started questioning whether you could handle this. Mm -hmm. He never explains that to him. And Job doesn't, after he encounters God, he doesn't seem to need that answered anymore because well, he just right. puts his hand over and says, I wish I'd kept my mouth shut and never said anything. I understand yeah. now that it really doesn't matter. In chapter 42, he said, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now I've seen See? you and I repent myself in sackcloth and ashes. Mm -hmm. I, those are such great verses that show the growing faith. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct thy paths. Mm -hmm. It was enough for Job and for us to know that there is a God in heaven, Daniel 2.28. He is able to deliver us, Daniel 3.17. And he rules in the kingdoms of men, mm -hmm. Daniel 4, 25. Mm -hmm. We used to sing an old song, Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. And if we all believe that, that he ruleth by his power forever, Psalm 66, 7, we don't have to have specific written out mm -hmm. exclamation point answers. We trust in the whom of the universe. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. Mm -hmm. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1, 12. And Job grew into that faith mm -hmm. and determination. Absolutely. Some of the great lessons that we learn is we should never ever put too much or ultimate trust in humanity. Job if, would have been dashed if he had done that. It had been really a tragedy. Mm -hmm. We need to trust in the God of heaven explicitly, mm -hmm. and then when troubles come, he'll op comes, He will open a door that we may be able to escape it, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Mm -hmm. we now, learn, let me comment on that passage. That right. passage doesn't teach that we will get away from suffering. 
but he will make a way in which we can bear up under it. That's so right. that's what Job had to do. He had to go through that, and yet mm -hmm. if he'd stick with it, God would see that he could make it. He could endure. And peace passing understanding, Philippians 4, 7, doesn't mean we'll have no trouble. It means that we'll have tranquility in the midst of in trouble. In the midst of affliction and My turbulence. peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Mm -hmm. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, Jesus said. And in the world you will have tribulation. That's right. John 14, 27, John 16, 33. Mm -hmm. I also learned that human wisdom always falls short. Mm -hmm. Some of the ironic statements, even sarcasm statements, mm -hmm. surely wisdom will die with you. Mm -hmm. For you are the people and wisdom will die with you. Chapter 12, verse 2 of Job. That's right. It's a, I, I think it's interesting too when he cries in chapter 23, oh, that I knew where I could find God. Mm -hmm. I would come before his throne. Mm -hmm. Well, Christians know. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus is our propitiation, mm -hmm. our mercy seat, 1 John 2, 1 and 2. And we come to God through Him, John 16, 24. The, the tearing of the uh, curtain at His death signified right. that we now have direct access to the throne of God. That's right. A new and living way through the veil of His flesh, mm -hmm. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20, the death of Christ. There are a lot of rich and great things. Another thing that I learned is that suffering is not always bad. It can make us stronger. The psalmist said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. It has been good for me to be afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Mm -hmm. Psalm 119, verse 67 and 71. In the crucible of suffering, in the furnace of affliction, Isaiah 48, 10 and 1 Peter 1, 7, 8, the true, pure, glistening goal of Job, a righteous man, came mm -hmm. forth. But it mm -hmm. took the polish of suffering and anguish to make him a better man. Mm -hmm. uh, Chapter 23, verse 10 of the book talks about uh, Job saying, uh, when he has tried me, mm -hmm. I shall come forth as gold. So he was confident that through all of this hardship and suffering that he would come out on top as being demonstrated to be the goal that God wanted him to First be. 1 Peter 1, 7 and 8 says, Christians are tried in a furnace as gold is tried in a fire, and the chaff and the dross and the impurity fades away, but mm -hmm. the Christian has joy unspeakable and full of glory because he's been refined in the furnace mm -hmm. of God's grace. James chapter 1 speaks of uh, brethren count it all uh, joy. joy when you fall into various temptations, meaning testings, because the trying of your faith works patience. So it actually develops and matures us. Hebrews 12 is one of the greatest passages on discipline that God extends to His people. In fact, He says, if you're not disciplined, if you're not going through suffering and hardship, you're not loved. That's you're an right. illegitimate child. That's because right. God chastens and scourges the people that He loves. In Revelation 3.19, Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Isn't that a quotation of Proverbs 3? Right. Be zealous therefore and repent. So mm -hmm. Old Testament and New Testament, the purpose, depth, richness, of suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and shall stand upon the earth in the last days, Job 19, 25. What all he may have meant by that, it's still a beautiful verse because mm -hmm. our Redeemer did come mm -hmm. and we're redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, mm -hmm. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. So there's so many overtones and introductory statements to the New Testament, the life of Christ and Christianity in the mm -hmm. background of Job he was a marvelous man. You mentioned, uh, I think, early on in our program the fact that um, we mustn't allow the, our critics to push us in the wrong direction. Did you give Moses as an example of that? Yeah, in, uh, just barely mentioned the fact that he was pushed, though he was so meek, the ungodliness of the people continually putting pressure on him. Aggravated him, him huh? Right, and aggravated him to the agitated extent him. that he spoke inadvisedly with his lips. Psalm 106, mm -hmm. verse 32 Ended and 33. Ended up being banished from the, from the land of promise because he allowed them to goad him into that. And yet every day I hear someone say, look what they made me do. Mm -hmm. And nearly every counselor gets paid high money for resurrecting some ghosts of the past that maybe someone did this. But Jude 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. 2 John 8 says, look to yourselves, lest you use your own reward. 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians 13 and 1 Corinthians 11, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Mm -hmm. So it's an individual responsibility, and Job couldn't pass it off. In fact, nearly everybody he knew either died or faded into oblivion. Mm -hmm. So it's a rich and rare book. I think we have time maybe for one more point or lesson. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? I think it's interesting that some of the expressions we use really do come from the Bible, like, 1920 of Job by the skin of our teeth. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things like that in the Bible and Job really had a struggle. Mm -hmm. But I believe what you said about chapters 38 through 42 really set forth his camaraderie with God and Satan couldn't break that. He tried his best. Mm -hmm. He threw
every weapon in his arsenal mm -hmm. at Job and against God, and it didn't separate those two. You know, this book, uh, one of the big problems of, of human existence, which the <clears throat> atheist spends a lot of time on, thinking that that disproves God, is the problem of suffering. The fact there's, there's hardship and, and innocent suffering in the world, and they think that proves there's no God. And certainly the book of Job addresses that matter. That's a key theme to the book. But what I really see coming out of this book, as you said, especially in chapters 38 through 42, 6, is that uh, when a person commits their life to God, when a person fashions their entire existence around God's Word and doing what God would have them to do, no matter what may be swirling around us in life, then uh, He will be with us, and we really do not need to have the answers to all of these puzzling questions of why the universe runs the way it does and why things happen the way they do. Because if we commit ourselves to God, He has assured us that in due time, we will reap if we faint not. There will come a day when, we, when everything will be set straight, and certainly a judgment, everything will be set straight, and we will be permitted to see the eternal glories of God. A commentary on this is Paul's closing paragraph of Romans 8. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a good finishing statement. Thank you for being with us today. Don't go away. I'll be back in just a moment and make available this good material for you. A choice to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save and fitted for the Johnny and I have enjoyed bringing this message to you today from the book of Job, and we would like for you to have a free copy of an audio cassette tape that is provided pertaining to this program, and all you have to do is write us this week. We'll send it to you free of charge. Our address is The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas. 76053. Write us at that address this week. Ask for the free audio cassette tape pertaining to the book of Job, and we will send it to you without any obligation or cost on your part. Thank you for watching the program today. We urge you to study the Word of God, pray to Him, seek to follow Him, and to do His will. We pray God will bless you throughout this week. Now the full revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in love and grow up unto Him. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth, speaking the truth, speaking the truth.